Yeah. And Linda is Professor of Sociology and the Director at Maynooth University Social Science Institute. Uh, and she was a University of Cambridge Centre for Gender Studies Visiting Scholar during the Lent term of 2022. And her research interests include feminism, gender, family, conflict, or conflict-related violence, uh, wars, migration, and Irish studies. And she's the author of several recent publications, including on the gender-based violence women experienced in the Irish Revolution between 1919 and 23, uh, and led the Irish Research Council-funded Women and the Irish Revolution Project, the really fantastic project. Um, she's published a number of books, The Irish Women's Movement from Revolution to Devolution, uh, for Palgrave in 2003, Documenting Irish Feminisms, The Second Wave, with Tina O'Toole, uh, republished in 2020. Uh, Social Movements in Ireland with Neve Horgan uh, 2006 and the Irish Family in 2014 and Women and the Irish Revolution, Feminism, Activism, Violence uh, in 2020. So a very busy publishing profile. So welcome, Linda. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be back in, in IFI. I haven't been here since before the pandemic. So um, everything is a step forward, isn't it, at the moment? <laughs> um, so thanks very much and congratulations on such a, a, a brilliant um, conceptualization for a symposium. And uh, I had uh, cut my paper back a little, but I, I might just kind of, now that we've a bit more time, I can put the small piece back in that I had crossed out. So bear with me. Uh, so I'm a, a sociologist, obviously, um, but I work a lot with historical materials. And um, so, so just to say I'm not a, a film theorist or an expert on photography by any means, so I'm hoping to learn a lot uh, from you as well today and see how you receive uh, some of the material uh, that I'm going to be going through. So, um, so the title of my paper in terms of capturing conflict is Sexual Policing During Ireland's War of Independence. So since uh, 2016 I have, I suppose, really researched and published many examples of, in particular, what I'm going to focus on today, the widespread implementation of what I call hair taking in the Irish War of Independence. So you'll see different phrases like hair cutting, shearing, cropping, but I like to use the phrase hair taking as well because obviously we allegedly own our own hair um, and it sort of implies that power <coughs> dynamic, a lack of consent um, and I suppose the violence um, that's involved in the taking of hair. Um, and, but this also occurs um, in other wars internationally as well, so it's important to look at the, I suppose, locate the Irish context, particularly the revolution, <coughs> in the international context. Um, so really, but I suppose the commonality is this practice um, has and is still being used today. I saw recently in Ukraine a report of uh, women having their, um, their, hair, their hair shaved. Um, it is used uh, universally, I suppose, to target, humiliate, control, injure, and sexually police women primarily, but not exclusively. This method of terrorizing and intimidating women was extensively deployed by both the IRA and Crown forces in the Irish Revolution. So again, it's quite interesting because it would be very nice, perhaps a need to say, oh, that was the black and tans, or it was just the IRA, but it seems to surpass, if you like, both sides. So there isn't a binary, um, I suppose, explanation for this. So as I wrote um, in um, 2019 in this History Ireland um, edition, um, women's experience of war has been more often forgotten, submerged, or perhaps considered less significant to the suffering and sacrifices made by heroic men in combat. The Irish Civil War, for instance, which we're commemorating this year, or, or not commemorating depending on how you look at it, um, may not have been a very large or a long war, but clearly the violence and the trauma it generated both in individual families and commu communities continues to resonate intergenerationally. Um, as I wrote in that 2019 piece and in several other um, publications I've done since, the inter this internecine conflict was described for decades as a conflict of brother against brother. And I suppose that kind of familial construct is interesting in itself, but it's also a gendered construct. Yet women were, as we know, very active as combatants. But also the presumption that because women were killed in far less numbers and that they weren't really impacted by the violence has been revised, largely as a consequence of the kinds of practices uh, I'm looking at here today. So serious atrocities against women um, as civilians and activists right across the class, religious, community divide 
um, are apparent in this period, uh, including in the Civil War by both anti-treaty and pro-treaty forces. I'm not going to talk about um, sexual violence today, but that's another aspect um, of this, along with other kinds of, um, I suppose, um, sexual harassment, that, those kinds of um, uh, uh, aspects of war. So what I've tried to do is, I suppose, provide, provide a more theoretically informed interpretation of gender and violence than was perhaps achieved in modern Irish history for much of the last century. Understanding the relationship between power, gender and sexuality is necessary, I would argue, to understanding both the very nature of the Irish Revolution and the state and society that emerged after independence in 1922, which is, was, of course, one of the most conservative and patriarchal post-revolutionary regimes to emerge in Europe. So women, um, just I want to say a little bit, when I talk about violence, people often think, think of it in a military way, but I also want to talk about love and intimacy in wartime because I suppose where you have war, you have violence, but you also have love and sex and attraction and all these other things um, that go with it. And the discussion of hair very much um, relates to that. So before, I, I'll be looking at uh, visual examples of this in a minute, but I just want to talk about this first, if you like, because I think it's quite important. So, obvious point, women as half the population clearly affect and are affected by wars. Violence against women in wartime is a global phenomenon that constitutes an important field of research. As I said, the impact of gender violence of women in the Irish Revolution uh, was until recently essentially unacknowledged in Irish history, despite the fact that the sociologist uh, Louise Ryan published a groundbreaking article on this subject in 2000 in the journal Feminist Review. So she was looking at this 20 years before it became um, quite popular to address these issues in recent years. Research by other scholars such as Cynthia Enlow in studies of militarization in other disciplines I've also long progressed um, these issues. So what I'm saying in a very nice way is um, all roads don't lead back to the discipline of history all the time. You know, there are other disciplines sort of looking at these for at least, um, these issues for at least uh, two decades prior. So in the IRC uh, funded Women in the Irish Revolution project, which I was awarded in 2017, I've excavated and published a large number of cases of gender-based and sexual violence in the Irish Revolution. As I said, the term forced hair cutting, um, hair taking was used in my research to capture a widespread form of sexual policing, bodily violence, and indeed social control, which was meted out by all sides in the conflict. The interplay of gender, sexuality, and power is evident in the deployment of such bodily violence which was specifically targeted at Irish women in this period. And again, I'm not going to go into this too much today, but the idea that this was kind of an accidental symptom of war is not really uh, backed up in the evidence. You can see that, for instance, hair cutting was quite planned, you know, um, and uh, it was part of a strategy, I suppose, uh, particularly of the IRA around um, women who were engaged in intimate relationships. So love, intimacy, sex and violence exist in all military conflicts. Constructions of gender, female sexuality, nation and violence have influenced attitudes to any kind of intimate fraternisation, if that's the correct term. You see kind of very interesting terms being used about female sexuality in wars. Fraternisation is one of them. Um, so women in Ireland's revolution who forge friendly or intimate relationships with British soldiers or their RIC, or members of the IRC, were often warned off, threatened, sexually policed, repressed, and punished through forced hair cutting and other violence performed by Republicans. Now, the cause of such punishment uh, was, I suppose, I don't mean to present a, simplist, a simplistic interpretation of that either, because the cause of such punishment was a combination of things, really. So first of all, security concerns. So women were considered dangerous if they were having these relationships because they could pass on um, intelligence uh, to the enemy, so to speak. And you have to remember the way the IRA was operating, in particular in the Irish War of Independence, any kind of information gained could prove lethal uh, for the other side. So if a woman is seen speaking to or uh, 
walking out um, with uh, a, a, a man from the other side. Um, you know, this was really a kind of a military problem, so to speak. Um, but it wasn't just that. So um, uh, the assisting the enemy was also seen, um, I suppose, as a form of collusion. Things like providing supplies. Uh, you know, if you had a shop and you were selling things um, to the crown forces. Um, what else? Um, a provision of accommodation was another one. Hotels, boarding, and other kinds of services. Things like cleaning, cooking. You know, the military was a huge operation. Um, so, you know, it required um, a lot of input. So if there was any kind of sense that this was dangerous to the other side, um, this form of punishment or threat uh, was imposed. But also what I call actual sexual policing, okay, which is the social control of women who consorted or who had intimate relationships with enemy men and were considered traitors um, as a result. But you can see the interplay of gender, sexuality and power in the different ways this was approached. So women's hair, so we'll we, we look at this in Ryan's Daughter in a second, uh, which I watched over Christmas, it came on TG Carr, um, and uh, there is actually a, a hair cutting scene in Ryan's Daughter, it's often um, forgotten I think, it's a long old film now to watch <laughs> on an afternoon, um, anyway. So women's hair was usually cropped, shaved or sheared uh, by several groups of masked men in a secluded space either on a road or outside a home in, in, the, in the case of the IRA perpetrating this. And there's lots of evidence, Bureau of Military History witness statements in the military archives, newspaper reports, and also RIC records record these extensively. So these, I suppose, are not isolated incidents. You know, they're occurring every few days, they're occurring in different parts of the country. Um, so it's amazing to think of how this was ignored as an aspect of the Irish Revolution, given how prevalent it was as a practice. Um, okay, so serious injuries were often caused and um, again I've kind of deconstructed at, at quite an early stage the idea that this was lenient, you know, sure, somebody getting your hair cut, you know, it's not the same as being killed or tortured, or, uh, but actually um, violence was often involved. Um, you see references to shock um, afterwards, mental illness um, and so forth because of the terror and the force inflicted. So women invariably could be dragged, held down, beaten. You know, you see references to being cut, sometimes tar uh, used, um, and um, also paint. I've seen some reports of paint uh, being poured over women as well. Uh, often women were blindfolded as well. So you can imagine that, that you know, the, I suppose the impact, the terror, the fear, and the trauma afterwards. So hair taking, <coughs> both in Ireland and in other wars throughout time, I suppose primarily as well represented a direct symbolic attack on women's sexual reputation. And this is, I suppose, is where sexuality comes into play. So if we go back throughout time, for instance, back, back to biblical times, women uh, who were considered, I can never say this word, adulteresses, <laughs> um, or um, you know, women who, who were sort of unfaithful to their husbands, often had their hair removed. Um, and novices, no, nuns who were uh, uh, novitiates, have their hair shaved as a mark of their virginal state. So hair, so I keep pointing my hair, hair is symbolically, <laughs> is um, totally intertwined with sexuality, with assumptions about female uh, sexuality in particular. So this is why I mean to remove it isn't just a kind of a, a blatant military act of violence, it's just huge symbolic uh, resonance. So removing hair marked women out in their communities as sexual transgressors, whores, um, the language of prostitution is often used. Horizontal collaborators, as we see in the Second World War, consorts, etc. And also, the taken hair, as I call it, could also be kept and um, produced by perpetrators um, as a kind of war trophy, a boast of power and domination of women, or as a badge of masculinity. Okay, so that's just it, one of the headlines. Um, okay, so I just, I'm just going to give you one example really, I'm going to fly through this. So again, just one of the examples from the newspapers here. Um, you know, at about 1am in the morning of the 26th, a party of men called, this is very typical, 15 to 20 in number, armed and disguised, called at a house in Tralee and forcibly dragged two girls into the roadway. So they knocked them down, brutally assaulted them, and uh, one of, they cut their hair off with a pair of shears, and they poured tar over the girls' hair. 
So it's just to give you a sample. So there's loads of these reports just to prove they exist. Um, and again, I have a, a few public pieces I've written on this. Um, I'll put those up at the end. Now, here's we finally get to something visual to add. So you're all familiar with this, I think. So I'm just, what I have to do is go on to the next one, right? I'm gonna, mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk, that's okay, because it's silent as I put this on. It's working, yeah. So this is, um, I, I first spoke about this in 2018 at a conference in Trinity, a symposium for the retirement of David Fitzpatrick, which was packed with, you know, all the great and the good um, from the discipline. And, um, sorry, it doesn't come on. And, um, Anyway, and it was kind of news to people there that this existed. Yeah, here we go. So uh, I'll just talk you through. So this is May Connolly. It's the only surviving news reel, as far as I'm aware, of alleged hair cutting in Ireland in the period, uh, which is in fact from Limerick in 1920. It's a 16 second, is it working? Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, <laughs> I'm going too slow. It's a 16 second silent clip with English intertitles produced by British Pathé. The full title <coughs> film reads, Sidelights on Sinn Féin. May Connolly was kicked and has her hair shorn for the crime of speaking to black and tans. So the camera, as you can see, shows the face and upper body of a young woman in an old kind of brown trench coat, isn't it? Um, buttoned up to the neck. She's standing at a doorway and turns her head to show her hair. It's been cut very short and unevenly. She smiles at the camera and you see the man with the heavy moustache lurking um, in the background as well, um, in the shadows behind her. And his face is kind of very, you have to kind of watch it closely, his face is very momentarily seen. So as I say, um, the IRA uh, cut or sheared hair, especially if a woman was considered too close to, as, as May was, uh, or intimate with members of the Crown Forces. I've tried to find her, um, I often do a lot of background research into some of the women, and I can't be clear, but I suspect she emigrated to America a few years after. I'm not 100% sure on that, so don't write it down as fact. <laughs> but I suspect um, it's her, um, which would have been a very common as well reaction. Um, you know, women sort of forcibly, um, you know, forced out of their communities as well, or perhaps voluntarily deciding to migrate because of the, the shame and the stigma. So, um, Crown Forces, um, as I said, oops. So here's just another example, I'm not going to read it all out, from the, the Bureau of Military History Witness Statements. Um, and again, you know, so this is Cork. There seems to be a lot of hair cutting in Cork. Um, and, you know, this um, IRA, excuse me, officer is describing how the women who were going out to meet the soldiers about and colleague had their hair bobbed. But the sentence I suppose I draw attention to is um, it clearly denoted her way of life. So it was like, you know, um, that she had, I suppose, um, it was, I suppose, again, that assumption um, about, you know, what these women were doing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's... <laughs> okay, and this is a very long one, but cutting a long story short, again, it's a woman who was, she'd written a letter to a member of the RSC, and um, the IRA took her out to cut her hair off. And I, I kind of find it a little bit moving because you could see here the girl was crying and her people were, sp were sprinkling holy water on her and on us, you know. She was a very beautiful girl before her hair was sheared and I pitied her, although I knew I should not in the circumstances. So this was one of the men involved. So we have very rich material, I suppose, is... is um Now, so, so I've just, I, as I said, I spoke about the May Connolly still in 2018 and I have... Um, I suppose I've spoken a few times about the kind of cinematic representations of this. And, and the first one, I'm going to just really focus on two uh, very quickly. Do I have to go on to the next one? So this is Rose Ryan's daughter. I'll just play it first. But why must it be Rosie? Because she was fornicating with a fella. Yes. 
She was a man, Mr. Ryan. She'd be shot. What is this? Listen, numbskull. Someone that morning went up to the camp and betrayed Tim O'Leary. Now who lives near enough? Who had time enough? Who would? Who did? That bitch you call your wife. Bring her out! But anyone could have if anyone did. The whole village was abroad. No, the village was down on the beach. Except you. You came late. We came together. We spoke to no one. You'd say that, of course. Young Cathy was with us. <laughs> Young Cathy would say black was white if you told her. But then anyone, anyone at all could have gone into the police station and used the telephone. That's where you're wrong. They couldn't. But they tell. No. Why not? Because Tom went in there himself and cut the wire. Didn't you, Tom? Well, you went in there yourself, didn't you? Yes. And you cut the wire, didn't you? Yes. say now? Nothing. Take her out. Are you taking her? No way. Stop it. So we're just skipping it along a bit. It's quite a long. You can, it's, it's available on the, but we just, isn't the end part. There's, um, essentially flying through this very long film but again you know where it's that that scene is called shamed by the townspeople and I think it's 1970 it's a very early representation so again it highlights I suppose how there was obviously some kind of memory mm. in 1970 of this that clearly again suggests that this wasn't just a si uh, something that had silence about it it was actually silenced I suppose as part of the, the cultural memory and the, um, the uh, historical canon um, of the state idea there it's um, Set during, it actually set during the Irish uh, uprising of 1916. You know, it's an epic love story of a married Irish woman, uh, Rose, whose dangerous affair with a British soldier uh, brings accusations of betrayal. Yet a stronger love for the teacher, her husband, may be found um, in, in, um, in the character of uh, Robert uh, Mitchum, who stands by her. Um, so it, it, again, it, I think it very much reflects what I was talking about earlier. I'm not going to show anything from the wind that shakes the barley, but again, uh, Ken Loach's 2006 uh, film also has, I suppose, uh, you know, set during the Irish War of Independence and the Civil War. Um, you know, uh, we see the, I suppose, the scene in which Sinead's hair is clipped in a violent scene um, using, um, I suppose, uh, force, as you can see, it's quite a violent scene, um, but also the, the, the cutting of the hair. And obviously Sinead is a Republican, so the previous one, it's a, the traitor, is involved with um, a British soldier. Here we have a Republican woman. Okay, so, um, so I'll try and pull this together. Okay, I'm on to the last bit. So um, I suppose I want to just finally mention hair and uh, global warfare and uh, some visual rep representations of that as well. So you've seen that, that's just more from I'm just going to go to actually this one first. <laughs> 
So as I said, hair taking is a weapon of war and punishment that appears in many conflicts globally. Ireland is no exception. Um, Anthony Beaver, for instance, in D-Day, the Battle for Normandy, has described Normandy, sorry, has described how during the Middle Ages the mark of shame denuding a woman of what was supposed to be her most seductive feature, i.e. her hair, had biblical origins and was commonly a punishment for adultery and an act of what we might call desexualization. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the targeting of women's hair as a mark of retribution and humiliation was, however, reintroduced in 20th century wars. And I think what's interesting is, although we see it at the end of the First World War, Ireland is one of the early examples in the 20th century uh, where we see this occurring. Um, so we see it, for instance, as I said, uh, German women who had relations with French troops after they occupied uh, the Rhineland in 1923 also suffered this fate. But likewise, women who participated in the Algerian War of Independence from 54 to 62, the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 1939. And here we have, um, again, there's lots of images, you know, if you look. Um, but this is um, the women who had their head shaved in Toledo for being relatives of Republicans in the Spanish Civil War in 1936 as well. Um, so there are many examples of this. But also the Greek Civil War from 1946 to 49. Um, and, and, and other um, contexts context as well, uh, all um, experienced head shaving, women experienced head shaving. Paul Preston, for instance, um, the scholar of the Spanish Civil War, in his writing has described how many women were murdered and thousands of the wives, sisters and mothered, mothers of executed leftists were subjected not only to hair cutting but also subject to rapes and other sexual abuses, uh, the humiliation of head shaving and also in, in this case, uh, the public soiling after the forced ingestion of castor oil. So the kinds of humiliation and violence which accompanies um, hair cutting, you know, we can't look at it, I suppose, as something in isolation from other forms of kind of very targeted gendered violence. Um, so again, uh, phalanges shave the heads of women from Republican fam families and label them prostitutes. And again, we see this language. In Greece, again, a huge literature in this really internationally if you think about it, uh, Catherine Stephatis in her work described how during the period of the white terror and the early stage of the civil war from 46 to 47, women were gang raped, forced into prostitution, sexually assaulted in public places or in front of their relatives, had their heads shaved and were stripped naked. Um, Julia Eichenberg has also compared how the cutting, shearing, and shaving of hair was a form of violence frequently used in both Ireland and Poland, especially following accusations of alleged sexual and political betrayal. So the two are together. Of course, just to come back, uh, women who allegedly formed relationships with Nazis experienced head shaving extensively during the liberation of France in 1944. And again, if you look at the photography of uh, Frank Caffe is absolutely fascinating on this. I often think if he wasn't there and photographed this, would we, would we even be acknowledging um, that this happened? Um, uh, because there's so much evidence of this. And it's interesting, in, in contrast to the Irish Revolution, which was obviously a much tinier war than um, the Second World War, we're not trying to compare like with like, uh, we're just looking at the practice. But again, it's quite inter interesting, um, you know, in, in, in terms of the, the horizontal collaborators, as they were called, the women who who allegedly um, were involved with Nazi soldiers, um, you know, that, that this was always was done very publicly, as you can see, it was done in the community, almost an element of, of carnival, parading the women uh, through the, the streets. Whereas I think in Ireland's revolution, it's more of a kind of a quiet thing that was done, you know, as I said, in domestic contexts or in fields nearby or whatever. Um, okay, so, um, so to conclude, um, what Anthony Beaver has described as the basically misogynistic practice and ugly carnival that took place during the liberation in France was also repeated in Belgium, Italy and Norway and the Netherlands and in several other uh, more contemporary wars globally. There is also widespread evidence that women have also been humiliated in this way. I mentioned Ukraine a minute ago. But also, for instance, and I have something coming on this subject, in the 1970s, women in Northern Ireland who formed relationships with British soldiers uh, were referred to as soldier dolls. 
for her for concert, concerts. They likewise had their hair cut um, and also charred and feathered, particularly in the early 1970s. Likewise, Palestinian women living <coughs> in the long-term um, Burj al Barjne refugee camp near Beirut, which was first set up in 1949, also experienced incidents of public head shaving, jeering, and humiliation at, at the Lebanese checkpoints in the 1980s. So I just want to finally mention two recent sources where I've picked up on uh, references to um, hair cutting or tarring and feathering. One is, um, which I kind of binged two weeks ago, the, the Beauty Queen of Jerusalem, um, which is the black and tans, obviously were in Ireland, many of them went on to Palestine in, um, 1922, Sean William Gannon has a very good book on this. Um, and there is a scene where it's an attempted tarring. You have to watch it closely because it's just, you can just see them stirring the tar, the British soldiers, okay, to obviously um, uh, punish a woman in similar circumstances. It's a really good series um, on Netflix. And then uh, another hair cutting again um, from the Spanish Civil War in the Endless Trench. I don't know if anybody's seen that movie on. I think it's gone from Netflix. It's a 2019 um, film about the Spanish Civil War, uh, a better man who hides um, for 30 years in his house behind a wall. But there is um, a related uh, haircut. It's, it's quite a good movie. Okay, so to conclude, I suppose that the taking um, of women's hair is therefore, it's a simple point, it's an established weapon of war that was both a feature of the Irish Revolution and many other revolutions and conflicts, conflicts globally including as we have seen uh, in relation to uh, the Ukraine in, in recently and as represented in the examples I have used here today and I hope it leads to some discussion. I just put up some of the um, publications if anyone is interested. Thank you very much.